Welcome back to our Central North Division contest. We had a wonderful rousing evaluation contest. Let's give all the contestants a round of applause. We've also had a lot of people who have made these two contests a success. If you've been an SAA or if you've done any kind of role to prepare for tonight, go ahead and raise your hand. <coughs> okay, let's give them a round of applause. We also have some judges. Don't raise your hands or your ballots. <laughs> I want to ask our chief judge who's counting, how are we doing? Okay, we're still looking for a couple more people to come. Let's take a look at our contestants. If you're a humor speech con contestant, one more time, a humor speech contestant, can you raise your hand? We should have seven of you. I see one, two, three, four. Six. Six. Six of you all. Thank you. Six. <laughs> all right. So before we get started, I'm going to have our contest master make sure all six of you are here. And as we read the individual order, let's double check that and make sure everybody's here when we do that. So with that, we need a couple more minutes. we we'll are wait for the rest of the functionaries to come in there. So we do have 30 more seconds for somebody else to tell us about a favorite memory of a fall conference. Who can come up there and give us a favorite memory of How a fall conference? How about you? Conference? How about Mr. Morrill? What's All your right. favorite memory of a fall conference? Favorite memory of a fall conference. Thank you, Tim, for asking. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget, you're on camera. I had the opportunity when I first started Toastmasters to be blessed with some great mentors. I told my mentor, Sporty King, I'm not very good at speaking off the cuff. You see me a couple of times stumble over my words with my enthusiasm, trying to say two words at once. You see me sometimes speaking real fast because I'm so excited. I'm learning how to slow down and enunciate and get my cross, nope, get my points across very <laughs> clearly. So I'm really thankful for what my mentor told me. He said, Bill, that's okay that you can't think well by thinking on your feet. We're going to put you in a table topics contest. <laughs> I said, no, 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 I'm not very good at that. But you know what, Bill? You're going to learn from people who care about you. We're going to help you practice. We're going to help you get better. And whether you get a little bit better or a lot better, the fact that you're growing is what Toastmasters is all about. So I was very fortunate within my first few months of Toastmasters to be up on the division stage, up on the podium. I had a t-shirt on, a shirt, and a suit, and I was sweating through all three of them. <laughs> my knees were knocking. I was trying to keep them still. I was tongue-tied, but I was really thankful to have the support of not just the people who got me there, but of the whole room. When I first started Toastmasters, I thought some of those faces that were looking at earnestly me were, were really upset with me, but they were really listening intently, encouraging me to go on. So I learned at Toastmasters I can make my mistakes, I can learn from my mistakes, but I also have fun along the way. And that was my favorite memory. I got a second place trophy that day. Ooh. And to me, it was like I won the Super Bowl. My family was there. They were jumping up and down for me. My mentor was a little mad because he thought I had it. But everybody else was really excited. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a really fun time. And that's what we're here about here today. Whether you win the big trophy, the small trophy, or just tied for fourth, we're here to learn, to have fun, and to share with others. Pick somebody. And with that, I think we're almost ready. I have a thumbs up from the Chief Judge. Let's hear from our Chief right. Judge back there. So, our functionaries are ready. I see our crowd is ready. And I know that our contest master is ready. Let's welcome Elton Marquez. Thank you, Mr. Bill Morrell. And thank you, everyone, for coming back. All right. <laughs> Make sure you turned off your cell phones again. And if you have a laughing fit, here is my advice. Breathe deep. And stop thinking. <laughs> but you can laugh all you want while the contestants are speaking. <laughs> if they say something funny, don't just laugh at them. All right. <laughs> are we ready to laugh? Yeah. <laughs> Give us a speech. Oh, yes. Yes, you may. <laughs> <laughs> the order of our contestants. First speaker, Daintree McFadden. Daintree McFadden, first speaker. Second speaker, 
Melody Bird. Melody, Melody Bird, second speaker. Third speaker, Paul Weiss. Paul Weiss, third speaker. Fourth speaker, Mileson Collins. Mileson Collins, fourth speaker. Fifth speaker, Amy Lee Sagami. Amy Lee Sagami, fifth speaker. And sixth speaker, Mary H. Kim. <coughs> Mary H. Kim. All right, that is the order. So we are ready to begin. Our first contestant, Daintree McFadden. Click, click, part two. Click, click, part two. Daintree McFadden. <laughs>
time, I was actually out of town, working out of town, and I was in Cleveland, Ohio, and I was out there for an entire week, and I really enjoyed this trip. And I met a serviceman, and he looked in my eyes, and I looked in his eyes, and there was a connection, and I was like, hmm, no pastor, no choir director, <laughs> no deacons, no ushers. But then I made a decision not to fall into temptation. So here I am, this young, vibrant, vibrant, single young woman waiting to be found. Yes, I will. But I have, I have a struggle. And that struggle is I need to find, I need to find a tailor, a tailor that can make a special dress for me. Um, and this dress, should be made of Velcro. <laughs> Velcro, yes, Velcro. So that click, click can be click, click. Our second speaker, Melody Bird, the art of talking, 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 the art of talking, talking, talking. Melody Bird. Late. 
Karen's at home waiting on money from the tooth fairy. That's a good thing, because she owes me 10 cents with interest. <laughs> this continued until I got my first report card. I was so excited to see all the A's and B's. What I wasn't excited about was Miss Pulley's comments. In the section where I expected to say, she's a delight to have in the classroom, Miss Pulley wrote, talking, talking, talking. <laughs>
talking, talking. I would like to bring up our next contestant, Paul Wise. Paul Wise, the man greeting, the man greeting, Paul Wise. Fellow Toastmasters, distinguished guests, and Dear friends, Kevin, hello, how are you coming up here? I haven't seen you in a long time. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is a classic instance of a male greeting gone completely awry. <laughs> in today's fast-paced world, the male greeting is ever-evolving. From some of the most simple fist bumps, <laughs> to some of the more elaborate secret handshakes. <laughs> a smooth and strong handshake can propel you and your chum into a prosperous evening of quality male bonding. <laughs> On the other hand, an awkward male greeting can be disastrous. And I would even go so far as to argue it could act as an impediment to male camaraderie. Therefore, tonight, I'd like to address three different situations in which awkward male greetings can occur and give my proposal for a more standardized system in which we can prevent this awkwardness and promote more quality male bonding. The first situation is the business setting. This is pretty straightforward. You have the handshake. You want to make good, strong handshake, web to web, Make solid eye contact and go with a couple of pumps. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Note with that, you want two pumps. Three, far too many. <laughs> One pump, and not nearly enough. <laughs> it's not very easy to get this business handshake wrong. One way to do so would be going with the cold dead fish grip. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I would note is you don't want to dwell on an important upcoming handshake for too long, as the anticipation might turn your sweaty palms into a slip and slide. <laughs> so great to finally meet you. <laughs> the second situation we come to is the family gathering. From my personal experience, this is a breeding ground of awkward male greetings. <laughs> when I was growing up, I was always very envious of my sisters. For them, it's pretty simple. They'll hug a male or female relative just the same. But for me, grandfathers, uncles, older cousins, so many options, and they all wanted to do something different, how could I keep track? For instance, some maybe just want the straight handshake. Put her there. <laughs> Others may want to put their hand on your shoulder. 
My, you're getting taller. <laughs> <laughs> Some yet even prefer the full frontal cross-armed uh, man hug. <laughs> With so many options to choose from, it's very hard to keep track. Oh my God. Therefore, my proposal is which the younger man extends his arm for a handshake, from there the elder takes his hand and chooses where to go with it. <laughs> maybe he'll leave it at the shake, maybe he'll grab your elbow, or better yet, he might reach in, take a step forward and pat you on the back like this, what I like to call the Gramps hug. <laughs> the third situation, and most important, is the peer-to-peer, -peer, often awkward, bro greeting. <laughs> As demonstrated earlier, these come in many shapes and sizes. However, unless earlier specified, I'd like to propose a system of two greetings to help prevent this awkwardness. The first greeting is what I like to call the down shake. You want to, as you see your friend, approach with your arm out, parallel to the ground, go with a simple grasp, slide, make sure to snap the fingers, and end with a bump. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the benefits of this down shake, it's smooth, stylish, classy, and simple. <laughs> However, there are certainly situations in which this downshake cannot adequately reflect you and your bro's relationship. For this, I would recommend the very popular bro hug. So, how to execute a bro hug. In this instance, you want to approach your friend with your hand up, elbow pointing towards the ground, and make a good solid contact with him. Bonus points for a loud clapping sound. <laughs> <laughs> From this position, <laughs> you're now in what I like to call the Arnold grip. <laughs> this gets its name from the scene in Predator where Arnold sees Carl Weathers for the first time and says, What's the matter, Dylan? <laughs> the CIA got you pushing too many pencils? <laughs> As you can see, this grip is most effective in a sleeveless shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and with humongous biceps. <laughs> From the Arnold grip, the rest is simple. Yeah. <laughs> the rest is simple. You take one step in, give a quick tap on the back, and step away. And note, no rock. <laughs> I truly only pray for you if you're left waiting for that rock. <laughs> One thing I would certainly caution, never go for the bro hug when someone else is going for the full frontal hug. <laughs> hey. <laughs> I think you'd have to be the Fonz to outcool that out. <laughs> To conclude, I don't want you to get me wrong, I'm not up here to promote censorship or conformity. <laughs> I think that there's a time and a place for a well-rehearsed handshake between two friends. As a rule of thumb, however, unless earlier specified, I'd like to go to this more standardized system so we can prevent this awkwardness moving forward and have better male relationships. All right, Paul, I gotta go. Paul, oh, all right. <laughs>
My fourth contestant, Mileson Collins. A conversation with a homeless guy. A conversation with a homeless guy, Mileson Collins. <laughs>
My standards was way too high. In fact, I don't expect to win this Toastmasters contest. That's right, my standards are way too high to just lower them down just a little bit. He told me that homeless people will not have to worry about being mugged. Rob, or having our homes broken into because we're homeless. <laughs> he told me about a time that he was sleeping outside of the Bank of America while it was being robbed. The robbers come out and look at him. He looked at him up with puppy dog eyes. They felt sorry and walked off. <laughs> he told me about another one of his homeless friends. He was sleeping under a viaduct. His homeless friend woke up, saw a woman getting mugged. He played dead. They beat him up. <laughs> Moral of the story, if you ever catch someone being robbed or mugged, do not play dead, please play homeless. Now, <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, he did the infamous homeless man gesture. He reached into his jacket, grabbed a Coca-Cola paper cup, and he said with pride, you got some change. I'm like, hold on, don't play me. You are an intelligent man, remember you had a wife and kids. And I, and I replied with the only logical thing I can think of. Rufus, I don't have any loose Coca-Cola to pour in your cup. <laughs> As I turned around and walked away, I said, Rufus, if you're perfectly mentally and physically able to change your life, how come you don't? He said, because, man, I hold the world record right now for all the homeless gestures and all the goals. Check this out. I own the homeless record for collecting the most money in a cup in one day. I also hold the homeless record for laying sideways on concrete and counting the cars going by. <laughs> I thought to myself, what do you guys have, the homeless Olympics or something? <laughs> At this point, I turned around and walked away. I said to myself, I'm done with this guy. But he told me, shoot for the moon. So if you miss, you would hit the stars. And I thought to myself, it's pretty funny coming from a guy that looks like he aimed for the second floor balcony and hit the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I turned around and walked away. As I got home, I gave my grandmother her milk and hurried back downstairs on the front porch. I told myself, man, I couldn't wait this weekend to go around shopping for homeless girls because I feel like, hey, with gas being $4.50 a gallon, it has to be a bargain to drop some off in the middle of nowhere after a day. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, needless to say, homeless people have always been my pride and joy. Believe it or not, I used to be homeless. Me and my mom, I was eight years old. We got evicted. I want you guys to know, most homeless people was normal just like us at one point. Most normal people are only one paycheck away from being homeless. Ladies and gentlemen, if I ever became homeless again, I already got my side of it. <laughs> 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 And I said, 
Yes, I love Paris. Thank you. <laughs> Jacob said, oh, I'm not talking about Paris, Mary. I'm talking about Hannibal. <laughs> Hannibal, Missouri. The mighty Mississippi. Home of the great Mark Twain. Think of the romance and the history. And I said, well, maybe. And then I did what any self-respecting spouse of a romantic would do. I googled it. Hannibal. There's actually a hundred-year-old mansion there that's been converted into a bed and breakfast. Click, I reserved that. Romantic. And for a couple hundred dollars more, you can get your own private dinner served by your own private waiter in the cupola on the top of the mansion. Click, I reserved that too. That's real romantic. So we drove down to Hannibal, and we drove into town, and there on the right we saw the Mark Twain Motel. On the left we saw the Tom Sawyer root beer stand, and up ahead we saw the Hawk Finn souvenir shop. And there in the center of town on a high hill we saw a three-story mansion with a cupola on top. That's our home for the night. Our host greeted us gave us the grand tour and the royal treatment. And then he said, well, I'll be seeing you folks in the morning. Good night. And we said, well, wait a minute. Don't you live here? And he said, oh, no. Uh, I got to go. <laughs> and we said, oh, this is a bed and breakfast. Where's the other guests? And he said, well, there are not. It's just you guys. <laughs> Bye. And we said, well, all right. We got a mansion to ourselves. And we were very happy. So at 6.30, we climbed up to the cupola for our own private dinner. And we looked out at a clear, cloudless evening. And we saw the sun setting in the west over the prairie. And we saw the full moon rise in the east over the Mississippi. And our waiter was a Turkish exchange student, very friendly. And he knew all the history of the house. And he told us everything. And then he said, by the way, do you guys know this place is haunted, right? And we said, oh, no, we didn't know that. But that's OK. We don't believe in ghosts. And he said, oh, yeah. All the guests have had some extraordinary phenomena. And by the way, I got to go. <laughs> My husband Jacob's a pastor, and he prayed grace before the meal. Dear Lord, please bless this house, and bless everyone in this house. That would be us. <laughs> and bless everyone who has ever lived in this house, and give them peace. Amen. <laughs> so we enjoyed our meal and we retired for the evening. And then about 2.30 in the morning, I heard a loud crash. So I sat up straight and I said, uh, Jacob, Jacob, wake up. I heard a crash. You better go investigate. And Jacob said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, Jacob, really, this could be the ghost. Please wake up. And Jacob said, oh. <laughs> So I decided to investigate. I climbed the stairs to the third floor. And there was a gorgeous ballroom draped with cobwebs. And I imagined the lovely ladies in their ball gowns twirling and the handsome gentlemen in their tuxedos bowing. But if those people were there that night, I didn't see them. <laughs> and so I crept next door to the schoolroom. And the wind was blowing in the window and the map was flapping against the wall and I saw the little dusty desks. And I imagined those school children bent over their books. And I imagined the governess wrapping a desk with her ruler. But if the ghosts of those people were there that night, I didn't see them. So down I went to the first floor, and there was the grand staircase. And I saw him. I saw him dressed in white. He had on a white suit, a white bow tie, a shock of white hair, and a white bushy mustache. And he had that cigar between his fingers. Why, it was the great Mark Twain himself. And there was a crowd of townspeople there. And they were listening to him tell his stories about the celebrated jumping frog of Calaveras County. And they laughed. So I said, I better tell Jacob. Jacob, Jacob, wake up. This time you better get up, man. It's Mark Twain. So he got up and he followed, rubbing his eyes. Crabby. And he said, Mary, there's no ghost. That's not Mark Twain. Why, the moonlight is coming in the window, playing tricks with your eyes. I said, well, I don't know, but we went back to bed. And the next morning, we were leaving. So we stood on the front porch of this mansion, and we looked out. 
at the mighty Mississippi and at Hannibal spread below us. And Jacob said, wasn't this a great trip, Mary? Think of it, the romance and the history. And I thought, you know, I'm not that sure. And I happened to look over my shoulder. Something caught my eye. Why, there he was again in the doorway of the mansion. Mark Twain. You know, this time, he winked at me. <laughs> and I winked back. And then the romance of it welled up in my heart. And I said, you know what, Jacob? You're right. Paris can wait. We've got Hannibal. <laughs> and you know what? We've got something even better. After 25 years of marriage, we've got romance. And that's the most important thing of all. Madam Contest. <laughs>
speed dating. I mean, a speed <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Good job. All right. So this is how the speed interviewing will go. I will ask you a question, and you will all answer it one at a time. What I point to you. <laughs> I have the power. Just kidding. All right. So everyone, yes, if you could scoot over so no one falls off, that would be great. <laughs> okay. So um, please state your name and your club. I am Patrick Stevenson, and my club is the South Loop Speak Freaks, Club 7079. Desi Pratt, Group House, Brew Shield, Club number two. Two? Yes, we have two clubs. Oh, I thought that was your club number. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, please. Gabrielle Schubart, Red Hot Toastmasters, 9692. Marlo Kemp, Cook County Toastmasters, 6671. Gwendolyn Graff, Wrigley Toastmasters. Not sure <laughs> <laughs> and Michael Beckett, Prudent Speakers, 1344951. Current Toastmaster experience as in leadership or communicator? What you're working on? I am working on my advanced communicator solely. Right. <laughs> Commentate communicator. <laughs> Advanced uh, Communicator Bronze, is that the first level? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. 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 Competent Communicator. Competent Communicator. Advanced Communicator Bronze. All right. Okay. The easy stuff out of the way. Now, I will attack you on, I mean, I will <laughs> a question. Thank you for filling out your biographies to give us something exciting to look about. Patrick, tell us about your interest, Banjo Camp. Banjo camp, tell us about that. Well, I, I work at a bank, and most people wouldn't expect a banker to be a, an avid banjo player or a banjist. Uh, <laughs> interesting fact to it, there are more banjo jokes on the internet than any other instrument. Feel free to look up yourself, Google. To... <laughs> but uh, a couple years after I started playing the banjo, I had the good fortune to come across an actual camp in the Smoky Mountains that focuses on flat picking and string instruments, the fiddle, the guitar, and the banjo. And I got to play the banjo in the mountains and learn about all these people that I had just seen in instructor manuals and videos and so forth. And my buddies and I were playing on the side of the road in one of the driving tours and cars started to slow down and roll down their windows and this guy pulls over in his truck, gets out and starts tapping his toes and he goes, man, I just moved to Tennessee from Texas and this is exactly how I thought it was going to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Desi, okay. I like Arnez. But that's another story. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, sorry, but you're an award winning. You're an award winner for a five star recipient. Tell us about your award as a five star recipient. What is that? Five star recipient award. You're nominated for something fantastic or outstanding above and beyond what you were employed to do. And they saw something very special in my work. And my then manager nominated me for a five star award. It went before the board and they judged it, approved it, and that's how it became a five star award. Did you win? I won, wow, I won the most beautiful piece of crystal with a five point star at the top of it. On the face of it, it has my name and my accomplishments. <laughs> Don't look at those over there. The sad thing about it is, you know, I have no place to display it. Gabrielle, thank you, by the way. I see in here a very interesting side thing that you do, and I would like to hear about your noble work as an eight week. Facilitator for bereaved children in hospice in Nolan, 
Yes. Hospice? Yes. Yes. Tell us about it. Yes. Well, I've been a hospice bereavement volunteer for 12 years at Volunteer Horizon Hospice. And just started a couple weeks ago a new opportunity, which is a group that we're running for children who are bereaved and their families. And um, so we've done two weeks so far, and it's, I'm just learning a lot, and it's a really great experience. So. Thank you. And Marlo, you spoke about appearing on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, and we're not going to talk about that because I see that you like reality TV shows. You also were trying out to be on Wheel of Fortune. Tell us about that experience. Yes, uh, I firmly believe, as Andy Warhol said, that every person is entitled to 15 minutes of fame. I did appear on Who Wants to Be a, a Millionaire for approximately 15 seconds, <laughs> which means I have roughly 14 minutes and 45 seconds left. <laughs> As for the Wheel of Fortune, I was always interested in trying out, and I signed up for one of these Wheel of Fortune contests where if they pull your name, you win a gazillion dollars or some fancy trip. And I received an email one day, and it said, you've been invited to show up at the Drake Hotel in Chicago for Wheel of Fortune tryouts. I eagerly made my way to Wheel of Fortune thinking I would meet the meet Pat Sajak and the absolutely lovely Banna White. And of course, I did get past the first round. There were maybe 50 people. Of the 50 people who tried out, there were 12 people who were invited to the second round. And of the folks in the second round, from that pool of second round contestants, they said they would draw uh, those who they felt were ready to go off the show. They told me they would call in two weeks. I'm still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my, my 15 minutes of fame is stuck at 1445. <laughs> All right. Gwen. Yes. I see something very disturbing in your, in your profile. And I would like for you to tell us why in the world did you swallow a live Goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was the president of the Residence Hall Association in my prosperous years in college, and until I was debarred. <laughs> because we had a running gig where we had how real men, so how real men drunk milk, did a lot of throwing up that day. <laughs> how real men ride in a car, they were packed into a Volkswagen. And how real men fish. So they had to all eat goldfish live. But so at the end, we still had pools of goldfish, so we all kind of just Snap dared off. each other <laughs> and said, I dare you. I did. It wiggles. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that very lively image. <laughs> Michael. Yes. I would like to hear more about your karate skills, and if you'd like to display them. Oh, uh, there will be no display. <laughs> 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 because I don't want to show it, because I really have to. <laughs> so that would not, not turn out well, but, but uh, so I, I've been, my, my family and I started karate uh, at the beginning of the summer, well, no, at the end of the summer, and um, we're learning some different moves like a palm strike and an uh, and, and elbow strike and other different kicks and stretches, and it's just been really kind of cool. It's mostly because we've all been able to do it together as a family, so we go on Tuesday and Thursday every week and learn karate as a family. Um, the interesting thing is, is that our first uh, belt graduation is also the 27th. So this is, is, may be tough. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Thank you, contestants, for being here today, entertaining all of us. I need to work on my hospice jokes. Sorry about that. Oh, yes. Go, go ahead. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I would like to present each one of you with a certification of participation, which basically means you're very brave people. <laughs> Patrick Stevenson.
to make any last minute announcements. We have some certificates to give the humorous contestants. They're right here. <coughs> and our chief judge is also giving some special certificates as well. Okay. Way to go, ma'am, chief judge. All right.
me up and I can be painting on swimming pool. No, right now I actually have my own tray, four feet by four feet, about two inches deep. It holds 15 gallons of water. And that's how I create my painting on water. And how do you have gallery shows with that? On our website. Oh, 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 how, okay, so once I create my image, I'll take a piece of paper, lay on top of it to capture it. That's how my name is Sigami. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Mileson, I see that you are, <laughs> your speech was about a homeless man. That's right. Yeah, however, your career is a financial advisor. Mm -hmm. So, did you give any financial advice to the homeless man, or did you <laughs> advising other people about your finances? Actually, though, Rufus is a real man. I, I really thought about bringing him today. No. We actually keep in contact. Um, uh, you know, from my experiences growing up, you know, with my mom and you know what we went through when I was young, that made me become a financial planner. I don't ever want to go back and recount those memories. So when I met Rufus, you know, he was, he was the happiest homeless man you ever met. I tell you, I mean, he can come up and brighten up anybody's day. You know, um, I keep in contact with him actually. I try my best to take care of him as much as I possibly can. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. And uh, needless to say, he's, he's actually no longer homeless. I've actually got him a job. And so he's doing much better now. So. I present all of you with a participation certificate. Again, this is a brave sticker. And I would like to call Wise. Reception line. And we're going to have the announcement of the winners from our contest master sale. Very good. Let's come on up. Let's give them a round of applause. All right. I would like first, and between every single speech, drum roll, please. Third place in evaluation contest. Gabrielle Schubert.
Shigami.